So I'm here to speak about how happy I am writing tests for Ember apps. Uh, a quick intro of who I am and why I'm here. I'm Katie Gengler. I work for Funding Gates, and we make accounts receivable software for small businesses. Our entire product UI is built in Ember. Uh, so for somewhere to start, why do we write tests as developers? Uh, one reason I write tests is to overcome developer inertia. Uh, a lot of times I can't get myself to do anything unless I have a failing test to make myself focus on one particular element of what I want to get done. Another reason I write tests is to document behavior, uh, especially for things that are heavy on business logic or uh, subtleties in edge cases. It's useful to have reference for how a feature behaves. And probably the primary reason I write tests is to prevent regressions. Uh, somebody once explained it to me as double entry accounting. Uh, it's, it's a guard against accidentally destroying <laughs> your previous work. And it allows you to have a safety net so that you can refactor and add features without any fear that you're going to destroy what you've built thus far. Uh, but sometimes I end up with a lot of testing pain. It, uh, and so what causes testing pain? Uh, I've narrowed it down to a few things. Uh, so slow tests, expensive tests, brittle tests, and flaky tests. Uh, slow tests, I, nobody likes sitting through a long test suite, and the longer it is, the less likely you are to write tests. Expensive tests, I consider that when the tests are very difficult to write. And usually in that instance, I'll decide not to write a test and wing it, you know, see what happens. Uh, if, if it's going to cost more in developer effort to write the test than it will, will to fix any issues that come down the line, it's probably not worth it. Uh, brittle uh, tests, if I make one small change and I have to spend hours combing through all of my test suite, it's not very useful to me. And flaky, if the tests pass on one machine and fail on another or fail today and not tomorrow, it's not very useful to me because I spend more time wondering why it's doing that than uh, getting the benefits of having a test suite. Uh, so I'm jumping to what is so awesome about Ember testing. Uh, with Ember testing, I can thoroughly test my UI. I've never been able to do this with any other uh, integration style test suite because they're flaky and brittle and slow. Uh, so now I can have a regression test suite for all the peculiarities and subtleties of my UI. Uh, frequently somebody would come to me in the past when I was working on JavaScript apps and they'd say, didn't we used to have a thing that would sort the customers? And I'd say, oh yeah, we did. We probably intentionally took that out. And then I'd look and no, the code was still there. It was just broken and usually I did it. Um, so especially in Ember, I think that uh, the ability to have a regression test for the UI when Ember is basically your UI layer is so valuable. Because in Ember, you can have one line that does so much work, which is great for us as developers to get to build something. But then we need to make sure we don't break it later. Uh, Ember integration tests are not slow. This is part of why I love it. Uh, we have a large suite, and it runs at about 100 milliseconds for each integration style test. And that may not be fast compared to certain unit tests, but compared to the integration style tests I've had to deal with in the past, it's like magic. They are not expensive. Uh, I find them very easy to develop once you have a few key pieces of infrastructure in place. They are not brittle, uh, given a little effort. Uh, if you put a little thought into how you structure your tests, they won't be brittle. I think one of the most common causes of brittle tests I've found is coupling. And with a couple types, uh, coupling to the DOM. So here is an example test. It's uh, opening a form, filling out an input, clicking a submit button, and looking for the, the input value in the, uh, in the page. It's very coupled to the DOM. Uh, if a designer or somebody else wants to change these classes, they're going to also have to change the test. Whereas, uh, or if you want to change them, or your class gets deleted, you're, they're going to break and you're going to have to fix them at some point. And just a little subtle tip trick that I do is I, I put classes on things that are named with spec dash. It's a holdover from when we're using Kanacha tests and Mocha. Now that we're using QUnit, maybe spec dash doesn't make as much sense, but 
It lets the designers uh, on our team uh, move them around, change the type of HTML element, and other developers as well. Uh, as they wish, so we can just use these things only for testing, never for uh, styling, and it lets us have uh, a lot of freedom. The other type of coupling is coupling to your data. Uh, tests necess necessitate ses setup. No, excuse me. <laughs> so this test uh, is looking for the outstanding bounce. And in this example, we're using a mock index response, which uses mock, age, uh, mock jacks, uh, using a JSON response that's just generated by our server side. And so this is saying uh, the bounce should be 439. But where did 439 come from? It's not obvious in this test. And it's because it's coupled to the JSON that's in mock, mock index response, which is returned from my server side. And so it's, it's kind of a brittleness that you're stuck, you're stuck with in some cases. Uh, and I think you need some of this kind of test. This test actually covers our, the gap between our Ember app and our API. It lets us ensure that the Ember app and the API are in sync. But here's a different way you could potentially write that test. Uh, create is a little helper I wrote that uh, lets you create objects directly in the store. So this is creating the organization outright local. Uh, locally client side with no not mocking any Ajax and then lets you look at the bounce and you can see very clearly where 439 came from and when you're testing something just like the display of a bounce this is probably an okay approach to take whereas with the other style with mocking the responses you could test a small sliver of your functionality that way just so you know you have kind of a test balloon that the the client and the server are in sync. Ember integration tests are not flaky, with a little awareness. Uh, Ember testing is designed to be aware of all the asynchronous behavior in your app, which should, in theory, prevent flickering failures that plague traditional UI integration tests. And they also allow that, that awareness of asynchronous is also what allows it to be fast. It doesn't have to pull like other uh, integration test frameworks. So I think the most common cause of flaky tests is asynchronous behavior. Uh, here is an example of a test, something you might try to do. It's, it's trying to see that all the customers are displayed and updates when customers are added. And this make helper is similar to the create helper. It just passes through. And so it's trying to create data after you've already interacted with the application. And this make helper is not an asynchronous helper. So this is where the gotcha is. It's, so you're trying to do something synchronous after you're doing something asynchronous. And because the way Ember, Ember testing works, it returns a test promise from uh, the asynchronous helpers and looks for that. So if you do these things, th this will actually fail with uh, the first assertion will fail saying displaying two matching customers. And so here's the corrected test. And what you can do is just wrap it in and then. Alternatively, you can turn make into an asynchronous helper. Uh, Anything that happens after the first asynchronous interaction with the application, usually visit, needs to either be in an async helper or be wrapped in and then, at least in my experience. Tell me if I'm wrong, please. <laughs> uh, the, the most common thing I see is people trying to create data later in the test. I also see direct interaction with the UI via jQuery, uh, somebody trying to trigger an event uh, using jQuery rather than using the helpers. And using the helpers is uh, what will save you because they are aware of the synchronous behavior and can wait for it. Uh, so I can thoroughly test my UI with Ember testing. This is why I love it. Uh, I don't have to deal with testing pain points such as brittleness, flakiness, or slowness, slowness, and that's really great for me. Something I wanted to mention is the testing pyramid. Uh, it was a concept, concept introduced by Mike Cohn. The idea is that you should have more unit tests than service tests, more service tests than UI tests, and that the idea is that this distribution of tests provides the best value and flexibility. Uh, the testing pyramid calls for the fewest UI tests because because they were called to be brittle, expensive, and time consuming. But as we've discussed, we can thoroughly test the UI in Ember without it being brittle, expensive, or time consuming. In our app, we have very few unit tests um, at Fun and Gates. We uh, only test things that have very explicit uh, logic. Everything else is tested through the integration tests. Uh, if I consider the application as a whole, uh, the Ember app plus our API, 
the testing pyramid still holds. The Ember app is our UI layer. Uh, a little bit about testing economics. So every time I mentioned this a little bit before, uh, if I'm going to write a test, is it going to provide me more value than it costs to write and maintain? If I leave off a unit test for now and have to later write it, is that going to be the end of the world? I, I personally don't think so. I think that driving things through the integration tests is great because what really matters is what the user sees. So here's a little helper. We have Pluralize, uh, very simple. And so we've actually unit tested this Pluralize helper, even though it doesn't do very much. How many tests should fail if I change Pluralize? This is a genuine question. It's something I've been thinking about. Uh, right now, if I, uh, I do it, so if I change it to singular plus e, <laughs> very silly. Uh, in my test suite, 10, 10 plus te tests fail when I break Pluralize. Uh, Pluralize is unit tested, but if I only unit tested it, the usages of it would not be tested, and they could bypass the helper altogether, just write in the, write in the actual string. Uh, they could be accidentally removed where they would no longer pluralize anything. So I feel like I need both, both levels of uh, security at this. I have some tips and tricks. I have a bunch of data helpers. Some of them you've seen in examples here. Uh, this helper is create. It creates a, uh, a, using Ember data, it creates an object in the store and then returns the object. Here's create a helper called make, and make passes through to create if there is not a create function for that type of object. And so the create functions are kind of basic uh, custom factories for my different types of objects. Uh, so here is one of those create factories, uh, create organization, and it creates a current organization because in my app that's the only type, only type of organization there'll ever be. Um, and it looks for it if it exists, returns it, otherwise it creates it. And I fi I'm finding this very flexible. It allows me to have maintain one kind of set of an object or F and not go overboard on attributes or anything, just set up what I need for each individual test. Here's that mock index response we saw before. Uh, mock request uh, returns this response that is uh, generated by my server-side API. Uh, this is what I use to make sure that the client and the server are in sync. Mock request uses mock jacks. I think a good alternative is probably Trex Pretender, which is very new. Another thing to think about in Ember apps is testing things you might not normally think to test. Uh, Ember is stateful, so if you're used to server-side programming, you don't usually have much state unless you're doing things a little differently. Uh, so this is an example of a test. I don't know how readable it is. Uh, it's a little bit longer, but what it is doing is it's testing that your, the, the state resets between documents. So it's a document that you can edit, and if I didn't, I discovered this myself, the edit state sticks between documents unless you explicitly reset it. So that's something you might want to test for in an Ember app that you wouldn't normally have to test for. I've done, done things like that with modal staying open and closing. So in summary, I love Ember testing. It lets me write an encompassing suite of tests for my UI that I can refactor and edit the UI with the same lack of fear as my server-side code and do it with a suite that is much faster. Thanks. Any questions? went about 10 minutes faster than my practice. <laughs> um, are you running your tests in CI? And if so, what were the challenges? Uh, I am running them in CI. And I, we didn't really have too many challenges. Uh, we're running them with a rake task, uh, actually, right now. Uh, hopefully, we'll eventually move to Ember CLI. Uh, running on our CI is Circle CI. And they ran fine with Phantom JS. Before this test suite, we had a test suite with Kanacha and Mocha of, of a much earlier version of an Ember app, of the same Ember app. And we were also running those on CI. Actually, I got a question. Um, in CI, are you 
still mocking out your requests or are you actually having a full integration test hitting a test version of your back end? Uh, so some of those responses, they're actually just generated from factory girl data if you have a Rails backend. And so those are a known quantity and those are, those are generated every time the tests are run. And then we do have capy, a few Capybara tests that go end to end to just completely verify that yes, everything's working, but trying to minimize those as much as possible because they are very flaky. Have you found any need to do multi-browser testing? Sorry? Have you found any need to do multi-browser testing? Multi-browser test. Uh, n not yet, but we, we would like to do that. It's just something we haven't gotten to. Uh, I know that a lot of people have managed to put it up on, um, shoot, what's that brow browser labs company? Sauce, Sauce. Sauce Labs, yes. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. Thank Katie. you.